The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to the apostles, As you go, make this proclamation. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons. Whatever cost you have received, without cost you have received, without cost you are to give. Do not take gold or silver or copper for your belts, No sack for the journey, or a second tunic, or sandals, or walking stick. The laborer deserves his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, look for a worthy person in it, and stay there until you leave. As you enter a house, wish it peace. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. If not, let your peace return to you. Whoever will not receive you or listen to your words, go outside that house or town and shake the dust from your feet. Amen, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on that day of judgment than for that town. The Gospel of the Lord. It is obvious that Joseph is an individual that we really quite rightfully could admire and think most highly of and probably more pertinently try to imitate. But at the same time, to realize that all that Joseph was and all that God did with him, as I mentioned yesterday, is also with us. At least in my eye, this is really one of the most compassionate, merciful stories in all of the Old Testament, and it should not be missed. Again, as we reflected yesterday, it's clear that Joseph was a man of God. Why were his cries so loud? I think it's appropriate that we can somewhat correctly presume that when the older brothers sold him into slavery, Joseph might have been, what, 12, 13, maybe 15 years old. He was the younger brother and kind of a real pain in the Adam's apple. And the father doted on him. So, of course, you know, the brothers were jealous, and they wanted to get rid of the little brat. And they did. Notice or consider the emotional makeup, the resentment, the bitterness, the abandonment, the rejection, the betrayal that Joseph lived with, at least in those early years. His fear, his loneliness for his mother and dad. He was initially in prison, I suspect only because he was uh, Jewish and not Egyptian. But if I remember the story correctly, it really was that he prophesied, how that came about, I don't recall, you can look it up in uh, Genesis here, it's chapter 44 or so. He prophesied or gave a word of prophecy to the Pharaoh and it came true. So through the course of these later years, Joseph might be all of what, 30? An old man in those days. But let's say it was only 10 or 12 or 15 years later. But again, consider his life. He suffered. But it seems to me that he survived. He landed on his feet because he remembered who he was, who the God was who he believed in. We can only imagine, but I think we can use our imagination and really get a reasonably good idea of how this young man prayed through all his losses and emotional and psychological pain. In that frame, 
I think we understand the sobs so loud that the Egyptians heard him and such news reached the Pharaoh's palace. That's a lot of weeping. It would become evident in those sobs they could, on the one hand, quite rightly represent a surrendering or a more complete letting go of the betrayal and abandonment and rejection, etc., the psychological pain that he suffered for those years. But he'd already let that go, really. Otherwise, he would not have been able to prophesy as effectively as he did. He was able, despite his own emotional pain, to claim who he was in God and who God was in him, his creativity, his talent, his intelligence, his capacity for administration came out, and he found himself to be second in command. <laughs> Pretty good work for a rejected, wounded, broken person. On the other hand, it's also correct to say, I think, that Joseph, through all that pain and through all those years, continued to love his parents. Is my father in his old age still in good health? He wants to know. Is my dad still alive? How is he? He's a person filled with love. Pretty obvious that the ordo, the order for liturgy, recommends that we use the prayers for the forgiveness of sin. Not only the forgiveness of our sins, but more pertinently, in light of today's story, for the forgiveness of the sins that have been done against us. That's why the story is so poignant, because there's nobody here that can't relate to the story in whatever great or small ways we've all had some similar, or not so similar, kinds of losses, pains, rejections, abandonments, whatever it's been in our own lives, we can relate to the story and we would be benefited by the healing of its peace. Joseph was able to find his peace. You can only imagine how dumbfounded these brothers would have been. The image comes to mind when the disciples, after the death of Jesus, are hiding behind locked doors out of fear. And Jesus walks in their midst. And can only first blush would say, they're shocked because he seems to be alive and back with them. But then, of course, they're going to feel the shame and the embarrassment and the guilt of having abandoned him. But then he says, peace be with you. And there's the connection with the gospel. Again, imagine what the disciples must have been feeling when Jesus said, go cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and drive out demons. Ah, uh, you're kidding, right? But he gave them authority. You remember that word from yesterday. He gave them the authority of his name. It impresses me that the first movement of that authority is to know our own peace. Because if we don't know an inner peace, we will not be able to be aware of the inner power that is ours in Christ. If you stay at a house and it's worthy of your peace, let your peace be upon it. If it's not worthy of it, allow your peace to return to you. That takes some time sometimes, doesn't it? The resentments, the bitterness, the ego, you know, I'll never forgive until or unless kind of attitudes and dispositions. That's not having one's peace. A lot here today. As we turn now from the altar of the word to the altar of the sacrifice, bring all that might be stirring in you at this moment and put it in the cup so that you can know the peace of the Lord and realize that it is or is to be your own peace. So that when you ask and pray for the forgiveness of your sins, that prayer by necessity has to include the forgiveness of the sins that have been done to you. There's another verse later in Matthew's Gospel, or maybe earlier, unless you forgive, nor will your Father forgive you.
Joseph is a great example of that. Those older boys must have been stunned. At the same time, consider how relieved they might have been, maybe six months later. Imagine the guilt and the shame they carried, having betrayed their brother. Yesterday, we heard Reuben say, yeah, yeah, I told you to leave him alone. I told you to not do that. You see, that's always going to be in their conscience. I suspect after this very cathartic human interaction, they must have had a great sigh of relief that, first of all, he was alive, he forgave them, and he served their needs. May the power of the word and the grace of the sacrament we're about to receive have its effect. As we have been forgiven, so may we forgive.